This is our second session now on Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. And before we dig into to details like, but God being rich in mercy, and a detail like great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. Before we dig in there and see the roots of our being made alive, I want to show something else about the connection between this and chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, that I think is so essential to catch on to the way Paul was praying back in chapter 1. So, Father, as Paul was praying for our hearts, eyes, our hearts, eyes to be enlightened, to know what is the immeasurable greatness of the power at work toward us, grant that we would see it now. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let me read enough of this so that you can see the question I'm asking. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, referring back to the same thing he said in verse 1, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So here's the great act of regeneration or new birth or new creation. This is the decisive work of God in how we got to be Christians, how we move from being dead to being alive in Christ Jesus, from having no spiritual sense at all as to the value of God, the preciousness of Christ, the truth of his gospel, to loving it with all of our heart. How did that change happen? He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him. So having made us alive, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places And there he will spend eternity showing us his kindness, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So focus your attention on he made us alive, he raised us up, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places. Let me do that again. So I include, so he made us alive. All of that there made us alive, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places. Keep those three things in your focus. And I want to make a connection between that and what we have seen in the prayer of Paul in chapter 1, verse 19. He prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened that we might know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And I want to know what's he referring to. What, what kind of event in our lives, the lives of believers, took this immeasurable greatness of power? What's he referring to? Is he referring to living the Christian life, or is he referring to how we became Christians, or maybe both? Look how he explains it. I want uh, you to see, I want you to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, and this, this power toward believers accords with the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he, one, raised him from the dead, and two, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, which happens to be far above all rule and authority. So he illustrates the kind of power that is shown to believers by the kind of power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead and to seat him at his right hand. So you can see maybe where I'm going. I'm suggesting that this power, therefore, since it's explained by these two things, the raising of Jesus from the dead 
and the seating of him in the heavenly places. And it is a power toward us that it is referring precisely to this. He made us alive in the next verses. And remember the chapter breaks were not there in the original. And so they would have just been reading straight through and they would have seen, Oh, Oh, he made us alive together with Christ and he raised us up with him. That's referring back to Christ having been raised in verse 19 and seated us with him. That's referring back to what he had done in 119 in the heavenly places, which is referred to. He seated us at the right hand in the heavenly places. So here's the resurrection of Jesus. He raised Jesus from the dead. Here's the seating of him at his right hand. And here's the heavenly places. And those three things are right here. He made us alive. And he, one, raised us with him. And two, seated us with him. Three, in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So my point is, when we read this prayer of Paul, we are to understand that Christ is the illustration of power, the power that it took to make us believers. That's the way I'm taking this. This is not just power to people who already believe. This is power to believers which got them to be believers. It is power toward us. It made us believers. It's a power that accords with the power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead, the power that it took to seat him at his right hand and to do it in the heavenly places. And and here's what's so amazingly practical about this. So here's Paul's prayer in the preceding verses. For this reason, because I went when I heard of your faith, which now we know took a miracle to bring about in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints. So there's one miracle. There's another miracle. I do not cease to give thanks what to God for these two miracles. I'm thanking God, remembering you in my prayers, and then. Not only am I thanking God for the miracle of your love and your faith, but I'm asking God that he would, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, specifically, that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened so that you would know something. That you would know what? What is the immeasurable greatness of the power it took to raise Christ and you from the dead? So this theology here of raising us up from the dead, making us alive, making us alive with Christ. That's the link back there to 119 to 20 and raising us with Christ, and seating us with Christ. That power is what Paul is pleading with God to help us know. So here's my question. How many Christians do you know who know what it took to get them saved, who are amazed it took the same power to get them saved that it took to raise Jesus from the dead and seat him at God's right hand. Remember, here's the setting in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We were dead. We were walking in lockstep with the age of this world. We were walking in lockstep with the prince of the power of the air. We were in bondage to our passions. We were carrying out the desires and wishes of body and mine. We were by nature children of wrath. These people are not going to be saved. It ain't going to happen, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Matthew 19, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
A camel can't get through the eye of a needle. So when the disciples hear him say that, they say, well, Who then can be saved? And Jesus didn't say, oh, oh, you're misunderstanding me. I didn't mean it was impossible. That's not what he said. He said, with man, it is impossible. That's why it takes such divine power. It is impossible. You know people. You love people, don't you? You have children or you have parents or brothers and sisters or friends who've shared the gospel with, and you know how utterly dead they are to spiritual things. It's impossible to change the heart so that people see the power it took to save them, which is why Paul is praying, Oh God, grant a spirit of wisdom and a revelation so that people can know you, specifically God, enlighten the eyes of their hearts so that they can know, know what, what immeasurable greatness of power it took to make them believers. It took the same power, the power that accords with the raising of Jesus from the dead. So, when we read here in verses 4 to 7, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. All of those links are intended to send us back to that prayer and remind us the immeasurable greatness of power. He wants us to know this, that we may know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. Who believe. That's how we got to believe when it was absolutely impossible. Oh, may God make us thankful and amazed that we are Christians.